So giving honor to God, our creator, our provider, and our redeemer. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves as we give honor to our spiritual guides, to our illuminated supreme mother, Mildred Davis Miller. Oh, be quiet and shine this here. This is Blessed Mary, Master Malvin Davis. <laughs> to Jesus the Christ, to To Jesus the Christ, to our friends, family, and loved ones, to our Supreme Father Marshall Davis, our Supreme Mother Alita Ravina Davis Drake, we greet you all with Hotep. Shalom. Peace abide. For our scripture, I will read the 145th Psalm. I will exalt you. My God, the King, I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your, work, on your, on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyously sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people exalt you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is trustworthy to all he and all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful to, in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him he hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, and but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Let us stand and repeat the Lord's prayer in unison, please. Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen, amen, amen. Thanks be to God. For his gifts of riches. Thanks be to God for his gifts of joy. Thanks be to God for his gift of health. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Okay, our song is Come Thou Almighty King. Have everything set up right. We should have the music in one second here. Thou Almighty King, help us thy name to sing. Help us to praise. Father, all glorious, for all victory.
glorious. Come and reign over us, ancient of days. And now we have our meditation. And our meditation comes from the book Sacred Astrology by our Supreme Father Marshall Davis. And this prayer is called the garden of my soul, the garden of my soul. So please sit up erect, take a moment to center your mind on the wonderful holiness of God that is a light within you. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, and now repeat after me. My body is a garden that I must cultivate to receive and sustain the divine rays of light from the awakening of my spirit soul being. I have been implanted in a physical body and tasked to maintain, to manage and maintain health. I will not allow my body to become a putrid wasteland of sickness and dis-ease. I use my supreme celestial power and divine intelligence to overcome the sense of pleasures and pain that negatively impact my character and hinder my success. I remove the weeds that seek to choke out the attributes that contribute to the accomplishing my goals to attain my highest potential and spiritual aspirations. Every organ of my body is a fruit of the tree of life. My body is a flower garden wherein I unfold the floral centers of my soul's divine faculties. Amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you. That ends our devotion. And we will have our lesson, which is, comes from the May message from our Supreme Father, Marshall Davis. You know, each year he gives us, uh, we can pull messages for each month. And we pull a message for the temple. And this is our message for May. And what it's going to be talking about, and what I gave a title to this lesson is, Praying Without Ceasing, How Supplications Increase Blessing. So praying without ceasing and how supplications increase blessings. Now, there are different types of prayers, and one type of prayer they have is the prayer of supplication. And so we're going to be talking about what does the word prayer mean from the Hebrew, and we're going to be talking about what does supplication mean. And one of the lines from the main, me main message, it says, praying without ceasing means ever being aligned with divinity. It is a state or spiritual consciousness in which one recognizes the wisdom, love, and power of God. So it's saying praying without ceasing is getting into a consciousness that you are aligned with the divinity. Uh, you know, there's an old song that said, yes, God is real. So it's saying it's like living your life. In every moment of your life, you're realizing that what? Yes, God is real. Yes, the thing I know about God is real. So that's what we're talking about. How do you get that type of consciousness so that you, your life becomes an unceasing prayer, realizing 
that God is real in your life and have it. What does this mean to uh, as a supplication to God? So those are the things we're going to be talking about as we talk about this message. And the first main thing we want to do is we want to look at one of the Hebrew words that is most often used to be the word prayer. Uh, and it also means to, one of the definitions of it is to make a supplication. And that is the word palal. And that's uh, from the strong numbering system. That's, that's the Hebrew word number 6,419. And it means to entreat, judgment, make prayer, make a supplication. And it comes from a primary root that actually means to judge, either officially or mentally. And by extension, to intercede, to pray, to entreat. It can mean judge or judgment, to make prayer or to make supplication. So this is the Hebrew word that is used for prayer. And you can see that it says it comes from a primary root that actually means to judge. And we have to think about that. So when you're praying, because it tells us judge not lest ye be judged. So why is it saying here that the word that is for prayer, because it's always telling you about praying, why did they use a root word that actually means judge when they're telling you about prayer? So a couple of ways you can think of the word judgment. You can think of the word judgment of you making some consideration about someone else. Or you deciding that this person is guilty or not guilty. You can make a judgment. But also, a judgment could be someone doing what? Someone making a judgment about you. Someone making a uh, prediction about you or making some type of um, statement about you. And what makes me think of when it says to judge here is, what does God think about you? What does God think about you? What is God's judgment for you? So when I think of prayer meaning judgment uh, or to judge, I think of trying to connect up with the idea of what God thinks about me. How does God see me? What does God want me to be? What does God desire for me? What is God's purpose for me? And this is telling me that through prayer, I am actually trying to connect up with how God sees me, how God judges me, how God wants me to be. And to actually intercede with the way I'm leading my life, because you said this to intercede or to entreat, but to intercede and start actually thinking is, how can I get myself from where I am with my own mind and get myself in tune what God thinks of me and God has planned for me. And make that the true supplication that I make. That the true, because remember supplication, and we'll talk more about it later, but a supplication is actually almost, because uh, 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 usually talking about it's a prayer that is made a humble prayer. And we know when we pray, one of the things we want to do is always talk about being humble, but that humbleness is actually just like you would do in a meditation where you're saying, I want to stop my own ju judging thinking process. And I want to connect up with the way God sees things, the way God judges things, the way God has planned for us to do things. I want to stop my interaction with that or my way of trying to see things. And I want to see just how God wants things to be for me. So I want to learn through meditation and a prayer how to stop my own uh, visions, mother used to call them. Let's call them visions. We call them visions, but she's saying you're where you wish things to be, the way you calculate things that should be in your life and try to get rid of that and try to see things as they purely, truly are by what? Connecting with how God sees them. So that's what we want to accomplish in our prayers, to try to get to this place where we are 
as it said early from this in, in this message, how we can get in tune with the way God has for us to live and stop all the noise of the outside world because so, the outside world will have you where you are, you'll be half crazy trying to keep up with the way what people are doing, what people are saying, and trying to make your own judgments on about whether they are good people or bad people, whether they're crazy or not crazy, whether they make sense or don't make sense. Because the most vile person you think is on this earth, the dumbest, craziest person you think on this earth, I'll ask you this question. Question, does God love them? Does God have a love for this person that you feel is the dumbest, craziest, most outrageous, nastiest, cruelest person? You have to always ask yourself, does God still love them? And unfortunately, when I ask myself the question too, too, too often the question comes back, what? Yes, love, God loves them. You know, like they used to say, um, God doesn't hate the player. He what? He hates the game. God may not put up with what they're doing, but that doesn't mean that God hates the what? The player. He's given them an opportunity to do things, but um, uh, to use their own will. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about, how God gives us blessings. And, but we have to actually apply the blessing. If you get, my, and we'll talk about it in, in depth more. God gives you energy, but that's just like saying like God gave you uh, gas. And you can decide whether well, you want to put it in your car, you want to put it in somebody else's car, you want to put it, you know, you just want to go out there and throw it out in the street and light, light a match to it. God gives us blessings. And when God gives it to him, God gives it to him with a godly intent. But that does not mean that you what? That you have to use it for what God intended it for. And that's how we fail. And then when we fail, we'll blame God for doing what? For having given us the gas. Even though God knows we needed the gas, but you needed the gas to put in your car and to drive. You didn't need the gas to go out there and pour it on somebody and light, uh, light it up. So it would uh, burn uncontrollably. So as we go through this, it will be telling us, uh, talking about how prayer can help you get in line with the true purpose of things and how that actually increased, how supplication actually increased the, the value, the power, and the manifestation of your blessings. So that's the Hebrew word prayer, payel, uh, um, uh, palalak. You know, I'm, I'm not Hebrew, so I don't always speak it right, but it's P-A-L-A-L. -A -L. Um, and as I said, in the Strong's numbering system is word number 6,419, a primary root that means to judge. So I actually looked at some other sources, and I got these from the Bible Hub, but this comes from a book called the, um, the Easton's Bible Dictionary, and it was on the topic of prayer. And this is what it said prayer is. And you're going to have to, uh, there's a, I know uh, when we're reading this, there's one word in here that I want you not to put your mind in the gutter when it talks this word, because it's talking about something not what you, what most people associate it with. In fact, let me say now, it's talking about something that is like a spontaneous spurting out, spurting out of something, not what you normally think it's about. Uh, uh, so it says that prayer is to converse with God, the intercourse of the soul with God, not to contemplate or meditate, but in direct address to him. I so said not in contemplation or meditation, but a direct address to him. Prayer may be oral or mental, occasional or constant, ejaculatory or formal. It is a beseeching the Lord, pouring out the soul before the Lord, praying or crying to heaven, 
uh, seeking unto God and making supplication, drawing near to God and bowing the knee. So and they're, they're, um, each one of these uh, things I was saying, like beseeching the Lord comes from Exodus 32, 11, pouring out of the soul uh, before the Lord comes from 1 Samuel 1, 15. Praying and crying to heaven comes from 2 Chronicles 32, 20. Seeking unto, uh, seeking unto God and making supplication comes from, it looks like Job 8, 5. And drawing near to God comes from Psalm 73, 28. And bowing the knees comes from Ephesians 3, 14. So in this Bible dictionary, it's trying to say, it's, it's actually what it's doing is trying to distinguish between uh, what is contemplation, what is meditation, and what is prayer. Um, and it says here that prayer then is this direct communication to God. And it says that others, contemplation and meditation, don't reach that level. You know, we were, when we were learning from mother, and I told you about those three levels, but mother believes that contemplation and meditation learn, helps you to learn how to do what? Get to the level of prayer. Here they're saying it's trying to distinguish from them, but where, the way mother distinguishes them is that you learn how to concentrate or contemplate things. You learn how to meditate things to get you to that state where you can learn how to pray. pray. But here is, uh, here is saying that they are distinct stages, contemplation, meditation, and prayer. But it says that, and that prayer can be, like I said, it can be a prayer can be something that you do out loud, which is called orally, or it can be something you just do in your mind. You can be, you can have a prayer that is done occasionally, and you can have a prayer that is done in a constant way. And here it uses the word ejaculatory to mean it can be something that just springs out and bursts from you, or it can be something that's formal, something that you actually sit down and uh, formalize, get a formula for how you'd want to do it and have it done as a formal thing. But always it should be something where you're trying to connect directly to God, that you're beseeching the Lord, you're pouring out your soul before the Lord, you're praying and crying to heaven, or you're seeking unto God and making supplications, drawing near God. And one of the things I want to point out when we're saying these things, because we talked earlier about the difference between the mind and the soul. And we said, especially in the ancient way of looking at it, the way that they looked, I mean, the heart and the soul, I'm sorry, the heart and the soul and the mind. In the ancient way, they looked more at the heart as actually being your mental uh, will and your calculating uh, thoughts and your character. And the soul was your feelings. And what, what I wanted to point out to you is that the things that we do as far as prayer actually has more, since it has more to do with your, your souls, it has more to do with your feelings than it does with your mental calculations. Do you actually put your feelings and the right types of feelings? You know, people always tell me, don't be emotional, don't have feelings. But I believe that people, since emotions are things that cause you to move, that's what the emotion actually means. What inspires you to move? What was that stimulus that it gave you to move? So when we're talking about don't be emotional, what we're talking about is don't be erratic. It's telling you not to be erratic. It's not telling you not to have feelings. It's stupid to think you're going to pick a spiritual path and you're not going to have feelings about things. To me, people even say that they're not getting emotional. But sadly, what they're doing sometimes is they're clinging to some of the lower emotions. They're clinging to things like hate. They're clinging to things like revenge, what, which are all what? Motivators. They're clinging to the wrong type of motivators. They're clinging to money. They're clinging to fame. But they're telling you don't get emotional. And when they're saying don't get emotional, what they're really talking about is you should go through life with what they call a poker face. That, that's all they really mean by don't get emotional. Go through life with a poker face. 
go through life where people don't know when they've said something to hurt your feelings. Well, uh, uh, don't show, uh, uh, it's not because, you know, they really say don't be emotional, but what they're saying is go around and look poker face all the time and don't let people, because they think that's going to give uh, insight into what they're doing. Because, you know, when you're playing poker, sometimes you're, you're lying. One of the best ways of winning poker is to what? Lie and fake the person out. Make them think you got a better hand than you got. And when they're saying don't be emotional, it's because that reason that they don't want you to know the emotions behind what they're doing. And many times when you look at some of the things that we see people doing, they're saying they're not, you know, they're, you know, because they love to tell you, oh, it's not nothing personal. But then it's either out of greed, fear, or hate. If you're doing what you're doing out of greed, fear, and hate, and it hurts me, why are you telling me it's not personal? In other words, you're telling me you would have done it to anybody. That's all you're telling me, that you would have been greedy, you would have been cruel, you would have been hateful to anybody. It's not just you individually, which to me actually is saying nothing. If you just didn't do it because of, of in, to me individually, why is that supposed to be some type of justification for you being cruel, nasty, hateful or greedy. It's not, it's not a justification. But if you're actually saying that you're trying to learn how to be more godlike and more spiritual, then that means you have to use your soul more, which means then that you need to get in contact with your feelings. And here, when it's talking about this conversation with God, it is not uh, a calculation that you do to get in contact with God. It's a what? It's a feeling. Why, how often the Bible tells you to what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, is love an emotion or not? It didn't tell you to sit down and draw a diagram of your relationship with God. It told you what? Love him. You know, even when we do the creed of honor and we talk about um, uh, who we're giving honor to. Actually, what you're trying to do is invoke the feeling that you have for that person or thing and connect it to your spiritual uh, thoughts and feelings. When you're saying giving honor to God, that means what? That you should have some type of feeling about who God is. And like I said, I don't mean it has to be this outburst, this crazy, you know, uh, fake which is many times it does not it should not be this fake emotion it should be a calm peaceful emotion because the type of emotion that help lead you to spiritual things are things that are what it talks about love it talks about peace these are emotions that the bible most often tells you to help you to lead to spiritual things because we believe that it has to do with what? Balance. How do you balance these emotions so that they get in line with the truth? So it is about being emotional, even though it's not some of the, you know, some people think if they get loud, they're showing sure emotional. Some people think if they get erratically angry, that that shows emotion. I mean, that shows, uh, it shows an emotion but it does not show the spiritual types of emotion that we feel that it helps you get connected to God. Because remember, the whole purpose of these things are the purpose of prayer is for you to make a connection with God. So to make a connection to God, you have to use emotions that are what? That are associated with God. Associated with God's mercy, associated with God's love, associated with God's peace. You need to have the same emotions that connect you to God or these feelings that connect you to God. And you need to do it in a balanced way. And in that type of way, by getting the same type of emotions that we say are related to God, not the emotions that are related to man, because man will teach you to what? Get revenge, get greed, get the thing, you know, get more uh, because you're greedy. Uh, be fearful and make sure you're protecting yourself. But those are not the ones that help you to the, the types of feelings that help you to cope to God. The feeling of love, feeling of peace, the feeling of joy, the feeling of bliss helps you to get closer to God and 
to me, makes your prayers more effective. So I um, also want to look at, this is a, um, uh, like a blog that's put out by a lady named Sue Sleshman. And in it, what she's talking about, why is prayer of supplication, prayer of supplication meaningful to Christians? And let me just read what she says here. I thought this was also what you want, because we said supplication. And it says, supplication is an old-fashioned word for request, most often used in old literature in the context of a weary pilgrim or a tortured prisoner. No surprise, the verb uh, supplicate originates from England in the 14th and 15th century as an angularized form of the Latin word supplicatus, which means to kneel. In Middle English definition was to pray humbly, to entreat or petition humbly. Supplication is a request, and if the request is made to God, it becomes a prayer. So we were talking about the uh, supplication. And here, I remember this, uh, uh, the way this lady sees it, supplication means a request. And if you look at it from where it was, and remember this is saying in the 14th or 15th century, how it was uh, an angelized word of looking at the Latin word, supplicatus, which meant to kneel. So, and, and so that's why I would put the idea of humble. They believe that if you kneel to something or uh, uh, kneel to something, you were doing what? Showing that you were humbling yourself, making yourself um, uh, lower or uh, to that thing. And, but it's to me, a supplication does mean a request, but the idea of it kneeling or humbling down is the same thing when you try to do in meditation, when you try to forget your own foolishness that you put attached to things. Forget your own ideas. That's what the kneeling down saying is. I am going to try to stop my own uh, thoughts and misconception, my own uh, playthings. You said one of our prayers talked about being a plaything of man. Some of the things we do are just playthings. We make these excuses, and most of them are just excuses. We make excuses of why we are angry. We make excuses of why we are hateful. We try to make excuses of why we are greedy and try to believe that, oh, God wants me to do this thing. God wants me, because we'll take God wants me to be victorious to mean God wants me to succeed. So anything I do, no matter how mean and hateful it is to succeed, that's what God wanted me to do. And people will leave, if I was succeeded, then what? Then that is what God actually meant to happen. And you see that so often that they, they you know, that's one of the things that, with, where I think where the Christianity got bent at a certain point because it got to the point where it's saying if a person uh, was rich and had property and things like that, it was because God had blessed them. Because how could they gotten, you know, and it's almost like how could have they gotten rich if it wasn't God's desire for them to be rich? And that's like, like saying that when a person steals, there was God that sent them to steal it from you. But their crazy logic actually would believe that, oh, just because I'm rich meant that God has blessed me. And just because you're rich could just mean that you were a thief. And if you are a thief, you're going to have to, by my recollection, you're going to have to pay for all those things that you stole, all those things that you did wrong. All of that is going to be actually a hindrance to your soul, which means your soul inside is not right with what you've done. So, but don't blame that on God because you have decided to take a path away from God with a great God, because God is telling you, try to help the poor, try to help those downtrodden, to be of, you know, to, to help the, the, the widow, to help the orphan, help the person who is hungry, Help the person who is in, uh, you know, come and visit the person who is in prison. But Anne tells you that the wicked flourish sometimes. In other words, in our sight, the, what? the wicked look like they're doing what? They're getting stuff. The Bible tells you that even though the wicked seems to flourish, but it tells you they look like they flourish. And now, but what? It, they're going to pay for it. It's going to come upon them. 
So if you're wicked and you have stolen a whole bunch of stuff and you have it, don't blame God or, or try to use that as an excuse. Oh, God must be wanted me to have that. I even think that in some ways, the way they even look at, you know, because, uh, um, you know, they have these big issues about guns and abortion and things like that. To me, their big thing is they're trying to say, you know, oh, if a, a, if a, um, if a person uh, of a woman is pregnant and she's about to die from that birth, what? That's God's will. If a, a, if a child was raped and she gets pregnant, that's God's will. And to me, that is a theft. That is an infraction of God's laws. And if you can have a doctor or someone that can come and help that person in this time when man's ways, man's passions, man's inability to protect the children have caused them, uh, especially when they have these women, the women is there, you know, they have these cases of these women, they're in the hospital about to die with a stillborn baby in them. And they're saying, oh, no, the doctors can't do anything about it. And I actually sent a woman home that the woman, I think she's in some kind of store, <coughs> a Walmart or some kind of store, and she actually delivered the stillborn baby in the store and almost bled to death because you were saying, oh, if she died, that was God's will? No. When the doctors could have done something to help them, you said the doctors shouldn't help them and make it seem like they're going against the will of God if they use the wisdom, knowledge, and power that God has given them to save a person's life. But that's just the way I think about it. So I believe that man can do things that causes wrong to happen and that we should intercede. And God tells us when you feed, find people in those conditions that we're supposed to go and try to help that person to get through that. But we're talking about supplications and how, even when we go before God, how we need to put away our own mental ways of trying to figure things out and try to connect up with the way God feels about these things and what God wants to produce. So um, that's the preliminary. Now we're going to go into the message for, uh, from, for me, our main message for the spiritual guidance temple. So this is, it's just one screen, so we shouldn't, shouldn't be too much longer. And thank you for being with me. In fact, I should ask, does anyone have any comments or questions? Because I didn't. Um, come on. And let me, I have most people muted. So if you, I've sent the request, if you want to unmute yourself and to, if you have a question, now you should be able to, if you want to unmute yourself, uh, if you're on a phone, it's with star six. But are there any qu questions or comments before we go to the actual message? Okay, then I'm going to read the message and then we'll go back and talk about, about it. Let me drink, get a drink of water first. Here it begins. Through prayer and meditation, you can open your consciousness to the realm of infinite wisdom. It is good to use one's intelligence and reasoning ability. However, you should seek direct divine communication with the highest source. Prayer and meditation generate an, alter an alternate state of consciousness that will align you with the divine dimensions. The divine dimensions are the planes where only good and holy outcomes are created and eternal truth is realized. This is the holy state from which all goodness comes. Seek to be a pure vessel for this pure energy substance. It is always available. However, as it enters the lower dimensions of the physical, it is sometimes contaminated and diminished. Prayer and meditation absorb the energy particle substance and become a divine channel. Establish a schedule of meditative practices to allow this radiance of divinity to flow into and through you. 
Be a being of radiant divine life. Be a wellspring through which divine energy flows and gives life. Be a living temple. Pray without ceasing. Praying without ceasing means ever being aligned with divinity. It is a state of spiritual consciousness in which one recognizes that the wisdom, power, the wisdom, love, and power of God are primal to the greatest resource to confront and overcome the adversities of the material existence and live a life of fulfillment, of live a life of fulfillment. Read the 145th Psalm and burn white and yellow candles together this month. So that is the message. And I hope when, when some of the things I said before can help you to see how I look at this message when it's saying that prayer and meditation can open you up or connect you with the heavenly reign, the realm where in, with wisdom comes intuitively. Uh, wisdom that comes intuitively means that it's not something that you, it just comes. It's not something that you have been taught or anything. You need to get to con connect it to that true wisdom that it just is like an intuition that you just feel it you just know it it just becomes a part of you and it said it's good to be intelligent and have reasoning ability but you want to connect that reasoning and intelligence ability with the divine communication to actually get to the higher source because through your reasonings and your uh intellect if they're not connected with god you can be, the way you see other people acting crazy about some of the things is, you will be acting crazy. To them, you will be acting crazy because you are not using um, what they would consider good sense. But to really have, you really want to have a divine sense. You want to be able to connect up with that divinity. And prayer is the best way for you to connect with those divine sources. It's the best way to you to connect to your divine feelings. Remember I said, we talked about feelings before, but there are all types of feelings you can have. You can have lower feelings or you can have higher feelings. Prayer, when it's done properly, will help connect you with the higher feelings you have. It will help connect you with the peace that we're always talking about. It will help you connect with that divine love. It will help you connect with uh, that bliss. It will help you connect with that glory of God so when you're looking at things that your regular intelligence will start saying, you know something, I need to adjust and be aligned with those things. I need to be aligned with God's divine love. I need to be aligned with God's glory. I need to be aligned with these things and what I'm doing. And prayer is what's going to help you get there. Remember when we were doing those meditation mountains with mother, when you got to that level of prayer, you actually wanted to become that principle that you were talking about. And most of those principles, when you really look at them, are really about some type of feeling that you have, not some type of calculation you make, uh, not something that you've used your intelligence on, but are you connected with those divine principles? That's what prayer is. That's what prayer should do. And, it, and it, it, if you want to yell it, fine. If you want to try to stay in harmony and peace, because to me, the more you stay balanced with it, and it's really balancing the things of life and becoming in, in harmony with them, but being come in harmony with divine love, come in harmony with peace, because get in harmony with mercy. And remember, because one of one of the divine principles is a justice, but the justice that we talk about comes from a Hebrew word that means a justice that tries to vindicate things, to try to correct things. So the justice we talk about is one, you know, we say we send people to uh, correction facilities, but aren't we lying? We're sending them to a punishment facility. And with the hope that punishing them will correct them. We really should call criminal punishment centers because we want the person to be punished. And through that punishment, have this idea that they are going to be corrected. But the only thing you're trying to correct is your feelings of was, because if you're punishing a person, too often when we punish a person, it's because we're trying to make ourselves feel better about what the person has done wrong. 
not trying to get the other person, when punishment should be trying to get the other person to learn how they can do things a better way. Especially when we do our children. A lot of times when they're, when they're uh, beating, punishing the child, it's because the parent is embarrassed. You're not trying to do anything to make the child learn uh, to do better. Uh, you're just trying to make the child suffer and see, oh, if you do these things, because you're trying to tell them, oh, if you do these things, this is what it will lead to. You can lead to you losing things. But a lot, to, but you have to be very careful that you are not doing it just because you are embarrassed, just because you're trying to be controlling. The child needs to learn. And sometimes that takes a tough attitude to what? To learn. And correcting doesn't mean covering up either. You want to try to cover up with the child. I remember they were talking on the radio station uh, earlier this week, asking them about, uh, I was thinking it was a 13-year-old child that shot a 20-year-old man. They didn't give the, uh, the exact things of the case, but it ends up his family turned him in. And everybody was talking about, wow, would you turn in your 13-year-old uh, uh, child? And they had, you know, on both sides, you know, no, I wouldn't turn in my 13-year-old child. And someone said, if you had a 13-year-old child, that had murdered someone and not just shot them in the head, but shot that person several times, that they need to go through some kind of correction process. They need to go through something. Uh, they need a lot of correction in their life. Now, is the criminal justice that we have always the best place for that correction? Sometimes it is worse because you send that child and that child will actually learn how to be a worse criminal or better, I don't know how you call it with criminal, but it teaches them more about crime than teaching them less about crime. You know, I even think about when we talk about um, uh, uh, in the Bible, uh, the Hebrews and, uh, and, the, and, uh, and the Egyptians. Uh, when I was looking one time, I saw, you know, it said that uh, it was talking about how the Egyptians and, and, the, and the people of the Bible didn't actually have prisons. I said, wait a minute, how could they not have prisons? Because they were talking about people being in these places. Um, but there wasn't a prison system like, because if you read about, because they're talk, talking the Bible, how um, um, Joseph was put in prison. But then when you read about him being in prison, he talks about he was in prison and he was giving people readings. And I said, wait a minute, that's, not a, that's a prison where he could just sit up there and he was making money off of people by giving them spiritual readings. Something doesn't seem right about this. But in Jewish society, in ancient Egyptian society, if you did a crime, you would try to make it to a holy city. And if you made it to that holy city, the family members of that person, you know, because usually if you made a crime, the family members of that person would come and hunt you down and, and, and get you. But if you made it to the holy city, they what? They could not get you back at that holy city. It was like a sanctuary. Like they talk about now how to change churches are a sanctuary. But that's, what, that's the way they did it before. You would have to go to one of these holy cities, and as long as you were in that holy city, it was forbidden for anybody to do anything unholy to you. That's when you hear the story about jo And for ancient Egyptians, the process was that you went to this holy city until you could go to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaoh could make a what? A judgment about you. That's what Joseph was doing. He was in one of these cities. Because uh, remember, it says that he ran away. The wife of the of the person who uh, who owned him uh, made these claims against him, and because they made these claims against him, he ran away to one of these holding cities. But while he was there, you hear these things about him trying to get someone because he wasn't uh, officially an Egyptian. How he was trying to get someone to do what? To get him before the Pharaoh, because if you can go before the Pharaoh, the Pharaoh could make a judgment about his case. And would make him so that the, if the Pharaoh said, oh, no, you're good, that means you can go anywhere and what? Nobody better bother with you because the Pharaoh had said what? You're good. And many times when people were going to these 
uh, uh, for the Jews, when they were going to these sacred cities, these sacred cities had priests and they had the coins and things like that, that they would work with you to try to get you to what? To actually do some correction in your life, to learn uh, something to actually change your life. So their system was more based on correction than what we're doing when we're saying we put people in prison. Even when I was studying some of the African societies, many, many of the African villages, they didn't have prisons. If you did something that they didn't like, they would either kill you or they would banish you. And to them, both of them was just bad. They would banish you from being a part of the village. Now, that's why when we see all of the, you know, and, we, and the crazy thing about it, we see hints of that in all these old jungle movies because they would catch these white people coming to their area when they weren't supposed to come there. They would just put them in some tent somewhere and tie them up. And they would have this gathering of all these people coming together. Now, we were talking about, oh, they were trying to eat them, but it was stupid that they were trying to eat them. What they were actually doing is that is the way they had uh, their courts or judgment. When they did a court or judgment on someone, they did what? They wanted all of their leaders, all of their people to come there to be there part of that judgment. So that's why those white people were sitting there in the tents tied up. They were waiting to go before the people where the people would make a judgment about whether they were going to live or whether they just were going to be banished. And, the, uh, and I kind of picked that up from a, uh, uh, a book that a lady had me read. It's called um, All Things Fall Apart. And in that, it tells you about how Africans had these uh, uh, court sessions, how they had these things where uh, everybody would gather together and, um, and have the, and the, and even though the people were in costumes and we would think, oh, they're just wearing around these costumes and, 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 and they're shaking rattles and all of that. And then you find out that there were actually uh, seven main costume people there and they were actually the head elders. And at a certain point, those head elders would take their seats and everybody that had a complaint would bring it before them and have them to actually then go into their, the, the round uh, hut they would have that was just for the elders to make decisions. And they would make decisions. They had to come out and they had to tell everybody the decision. And they had to make a decision that everybody would be happy with because anybody could question them and the decision they made. And this was from uh, uh, the story of All Things Fall Apart. It was chapter 10 of it. That's not the whole, the book wasn't about that. The book was about something else. Uh, the, the whole line of the story, all things fall apart. But one of the things that happens in there is they have this, uh, it looks like a village ceremony. And that's another thing you see a lot of times in, in these African movies where uh, everybody in the village is coming together and they have a party. A lot of times those things were coming together to either to get the, the uh, judges of the community to, together to make judgments, or they were getting the holy people together to have a place where you would go, uh, uh, when I think of some movies, you'll see a movie where uh, this white person would be given something to drink and they get drunk and next thing they see, they'd have these markings on them. Well, many times they did have those things where they would go there and the elders would take you off somewhere and they would have some type of uh, spiritual intercession for you. And because to show that you made it through that, they would put a marking on you. And that marking just have, may have saved their life. Because that marking did what? Showed that they had gone through some type of spiritual process that showed that they had been accepted. So it was a different way, but what they did not have is a system where, uh, of the dungeons, where if somebody did something, you put them away in a dungeon and you treated them cruelly for however long you wanted to keep them in that dungeon. I've seen, other than European societies, I've seen very few that have that system of putting a person in a dungeon where you got to take care of them, but you're just going to take care of them poorly for a long period of time and think that somehow that's going to change something that's going to cause some type of correction. Most village societies, they either euphemize you or kill you or they banish you so you can't be a part of that village anymore. But here we're talking about prayer and talking about how prayer and meditation 
will generate you to take you into that alternate state of consciousness where you can align with the divine dimensions. And it talks about, um, what did it have in here? It says that these adventures are only where good. And it talks about how, uh, you, where is it? Okay. Um, the good is always available. However, as it enters the lower dimensions of the physical. So many times what it's telling us that many of our prayers, there are, there is a plane where there is spiritual energy and spiritual answers to all those things that you need, want, and desire. But for those energies that come to the material plane, they go through, they, as it says here, they sometimes get contaminated and diminished. Because it said, God already knows what you need. Why do you got to go and pray about it? Because when God has already put it in the higher dimensions, what you need, how do you get it to you where it is not contaminated or diminished? And it's saying through prayer is one of the ways that you connect with that true answer that God's had for you up in the higher plane and get it down here in a manner that you can enjoy the blessing that God has for you. It was just like I was talking about the gasoline. When you do that prayer, God like has that gasoline can waiting there for you. But to get it to you, he has to kind of like go through the way things are passed out in the in, in material. It, to me, it always reminds me of um, many of the pro progress that black people made at the emancipation, um, uh, especially when we're doing things like uh, money to to revitalize even some of their communities. A lot of it was messed up. And what I mean by that is the government was sending money, like they have a lot of places they call blight and, um, um, and slime, I think. Blight and slime, I think it is. Uh, like Overtown. Overtown was one of these areas that was blighted by the many years that they had neglected black people. And there were government contracts to help these blighted communities to, uh, to, to, to build themselves up. And in Miami, when you look at those, the processes where they would go and apply for these federal grants to get that money, I swear to you, the Miami Arena was built with federal dollars to end blight climb in Overtown. Both of them. Uh, what's the name of the plane? Bis uh, Bicentennial Park was built with a lot, what most of it came from federal money that was supposed to be able to help Overtown. There are two uh, big structures that originally, um, I think it's Biscayne Towers and another big housing complex. Those housing complexes were built partially with federal money that was supposed to do what? In blight and devastation in Overtown. That money did not go to the people of Overtown. But it was federal dollars. When you, and, uh, uh, um, there was, and, and at one time during model cities, that there, were a lot of, there was a lot of money that came to, uh, I know Miami a little bit, came to, 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 that, to Liberty City. And it was one time that there was, when you go around Liberty City, you would see these new sidewalks that they had made. You would see these cement flower parts. You would see uh, cement um, bus benches. And you would look and you would find out that the mayor at that time was what? In a family that made cement. So the money wasn't going to actually to help the people of Liberty City. It was going to what? His cement companies. Because why did you need a cement flower pot? And I mean, they had some beautiful decorated cement flower pots in the middle of you didn't, where you didn't need them. And they had these big, hard cement bus benches 
that you really couldn't see, and a lot of them were very terrible because you couldn't see who snuck up behind you. Uh, it was like, and it was hard, so you're sitting on these hard things. Why did they have these semen but, but things? And yet the money was supposed to be there for what? Happening, helping these black communities to thrive. And even when they built these cement things, it wasn't even black crews doing what? Doing the work. So many times, and I'm saying that to say that even though the federal government can send down blessings, or God to send down blessings, by the time it gets to the administrators of, just like in, the, in those times, when it got to the ministers of the state and the ministers of the city, they had totally redirected what the funds were being used for. I'm saying that many times without prayer, that is what has happened to many of your blessings. They're up there in a state that when, that, when it's coming down to you, it's getting diminished. And it's getting diminished what? Because you are not aligned with the vibrations of God. And the way you can get aligned with those vibrations of God is through what? Through your prayer. You could prayer those things into manifestation in your life in the, in the way that God intended them to be. That's why we were talking earlier about this is about how do you get things in your life the way God intended it to be in your life when you know that it has to go through the process here. Remember, there was a prophet that talked about he was fasting and praying for 14 days for something to get the answer on when Israel would get out of uh, captivity. And when the angel Michael, I mean, the angel finally came to him, he said, God sent me on which day? The first day. But because of the princes and the, uh, uh, and, and, uh, the things I had to wait to Michael, who was an archangel who they believed that was uh, uh, the main, Jew, Jews believed that Ar Michael is the main arch. He had to wait to Michael to come to do what? To get him through all the foolish. And this was a prophet who had been praying for 14 days. But it does show you that what? Through prayer, you can get your blessing to get to you, even though it has to get through all of the things of the world. <laughs> You're messing a mess with the people around you. Because remember, it's not just your mess. Think of uh, it's, uh, it's your mess and the mess of those people around you, the way they mess up things, that they can mess up your blessing. But through prayer, you do what? You open the doorway to get that blessing in the way that it was in intended. What do we have? Uh, Mother Loretta wants to. Turn, let me turn mine off for a second. Shalom. I had a thought when you were talking about how your blessings are being held up from our situation and also from others individual you're beginning to dislike or to hate or finding excuses within them as you grow you learn to forgive and it's like water on the duck's back you let it run off because these are the things that will cut your blessings because people have done something or said something you don't worry about that especially when you pray for something don't let that hold you up because that's an obstacle that'll keep you from being blessed so to keep your blessings from being blocked let some of those things go sometimes you have to be the bigger person you're not always wrong in what you do and you're not always right either. But a lot of times, if you are wrong about something, and you, you, somebody has done something, just walk away. You can't get all uptight and have an attitude, and people are trying to calm you down to get you situated and quiet. You're not hearing. You're not listening because you're in that frame of mind where you just don't hear nothing or see nothing but red like a bull because you're so upset. 
and you're so agitated and aggravated, you don't hear a thing that anybody is telling you. And a lot of times, if you would just listen, that'll keep you from getting to a lot of trouble. Just listen for a moment because we're in anger. Remember, too, when you're angry, that affects your liver. And then when you get angry, you have to stay calm with different things. Learn to control your anger because every time somebody does something or say something, you don't have to just jump on that. You have to sometimes just tune that out and just keep walking. Like a situation I'd have them in the house with the floor. I look at it every day and smile and walk up by. You think I'm going to be aggravated every day about that? Because I know God has already, I prayed about it, and I asked him to send me the right person. Find me the right person to help me to get this job resolved. And that's what I do first. I try to put him first in the things that I want to do or to accomplish. That's why it's good when you do meditate. Because when you get up early in the morning and you say your prayers, or if you meditate, things will be instilled in you and tell you which way to go or tell you what to do. And it'll be a confirmation that somebody will come up and say, well, I know this guy that knows how to do so-and-so. And you had no idea that this was the person that you needed to see. You're just talking about something, and they're sending you to the right person to solve your solution. So the solution will already be resolved because you're going to get it from a TV program or somebody will come up and tell you that will help you if you would just pray and meditate and trust in the will of God. So true, that was Mother Loretta uh, speaking, if y'all didn't catch her voice. Um, but it's so true, because when she was saying that, it reminded me, um, we have a prayer called the altar prayer, and there's two lines that I always like to look at in that. And uh, one line talks about um, um, not being a plaything of man and his passions. Because a lot of times what she's saying, we lose our blessing because we become people play things. We become, they, somebody doesn't like you. They want to make you angry. So when you become angry, they become filled with joy because they did it to what? To make you angry. Because when you're angry, you disconnected yourself from God. Your anger has slacked up on your own blessings. And so one of the things is saying, stop being this plaything of people where they can just say something and get you all upset that you lose your connection to God and then uh, justify. That's why I say a lot of times we make an excuse. We make an excuse for uh, anger saying they did this. People are weak. People are, uh, 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 are, are, are misguided. And them being weak and misguided is no excuse for you to be their plaything. And that's what we do sometimes. We become their plaything, and they just have us, you know, running around uh, like a dog takes, take chasing his own tail. And you have to, and just like this prayer says, you have to pray sometimes. Part of your prayer should be, don't let me get caught up in these playthings. Another line from, it said, uh, from that prayer talks about, um, no words have a clue will turn me aside, nor discord dare move me from my serenity. You always want to have your serenity. Remember, we talked about prayer. It relates to praying without ceasing. That praying without ceasing means you always want to have a connection with God in everything you do. That's your serenity. So don't let words or uh, any type of discords you see around you do what? Take you out of your serenity. The things that we're talking, the feelings that we're talking about are things that will make you feel serene. We're talking about love. We're talking about peace. Why? Because peace keeps you in connection with God because we believe that all these things are our God. It's like turning, tuning your radio station to one of God's channels. So it's saying don't let words and discord disconnect you from your serenity because this is saying is you are going to contaminate and diminish your prayers. Anyone else have any thoughts? Thank you, Brother Loretta, for, for, for sharing that with us. Go ahead. Mother Loretta has another thought. Let me turn mine off again. As you were talking, I could just see a, a bubble 
myself in a bubble. So what you can do is just place yourself in a bubble consciously. Place yourself in that bubble and everything on or out. You're within the bubble, but everything on the outside of that bubble, you know, it, you, you're going to have where you have maybe bump into the, something or have a situation, but you have, place yourself in that bubble and don't see your bubble bursting into anything that comes in your path because you're going to tell yourself you're covered. Anything that you need or, or have to have or get, you're going to be protected because all the outside influences and all the negativity, it depends on your consciousness, though, within that bubble, how you're thinking, so you don't cause yourself to burst that bubble while you're in there. But once you're in there on the outside and you're looking at everybody on the outside, you just let them say and do whatever they want to say because you know you in that bubble, you're protected, you're covered, and everything that you're supposed to have that God sees fit to give you, you're going to get. Nobody can take anything away from you or can't give you anything that God see that you're supposed to have, regardless of the circumstances, obstacles may come up, anything could come up, but you're going to eventually get what you're supposed to have. Don't rush God. Don't rush. He's going to give it to you when you're supposed to have it. That's another thing. We're not patient. Well, I prayed to God. I've given people scriptures. And they, well, you told me to read this for a job. I haven't got a job yet. What am I supposed to do? Keep reading. You haven't read enough. You don't know you're saying that you're cutting yourself. Your job is already out there. But look how you're looking. You're already negative. So you have to be positive in the things that you're thinking and doing because God already has that blessing for you. Just like you say, he already know what you need. All you have to do is ask him and agree and trust and believe that he's going to give it to you. That's what I do. I get everything I need. Not what I want, but I get what I need because everything I want, I don't need. Thank you. No, when she was saying that, it keeps reminding me of some of our prayers. We have another prayer in the line of it uh, that kind of helped me in my life. Uh, one of them is saying, make my heart a sanctuary of love so boundless that no child, when she was thinking the bubble, that's what I was thinking about. Make my heart a sanctuary. That's my bubble. It's not just, to me, it's not just a bubble. It's like this sanctuary of love that's so boundless that no child can walk outside the radius of it and claim a welcome there. And you know the end part of that tells me? You know, sometimes we think that people won't walk outside the radius of love, and they will. But you don't have to welcome them there. It, you, when it says, and, and, uh, uh, and claim that you, they, that you wanted them to be out there, you didn't want them to be outside of your love. You wanted them to be inside of your sanctuary of love. If they chose to step out of it, you didn't, you didn't tell them, you know, get out of my sanctuary of my love. No. Yours was boundless that they could, if they wanted to, they what? You can enter into my sanctuary of love because my love is God. Now, but if you walk outside of it, that's not where I want you to be. And that's how we have to look at sometimes when people walk outside of the, bound, you know, the, in, the boundlessness of your, your love, that you didn't ask them to be there. You didn't, you know, uh, uh, curse them and say, I want you to be outside of my love. They went there and you just have to accept because you just want your bubble or your sanctuary to be clean and your sanctuary to be a holy place, a sanctuary of just what we're talking about, of that type of love that will keep you where blessings can get to you. Anyone else have any comments? Because that's really the end of the lesson, and I just want to mention these things that um, these are announcements. Tomorrow is May 1st, that's the beginning of May, and in May, we drink sage tea. So you can start your sage tea um, tomorrow, May 1st, and that helps so much with your, uh, with your eyes. So it's a good time to get that sage tea to help to 
work as a cleanse in your eyes. Uh, yeah, and the, and the first thing maybe you can also, you can catch some water out there and you can use that for, your, for uh, even for cleaning your hair and stuff for uh, that water. So you wanna try to catch some of that May rain on May 1st and look like we're gonna have some, the way thing we're gonna have some rain. Um, Oh, and today I want to mention that today that they are actually having Pleasant Sunday at Divine Life Temple. I was trying to find my page to tell me what time it started. I'm not sure. I think they, when they do the, because I thought when they did the um, uh, Pleasant Sunday, they started a little later. Oh, I do have a thing that the Dade County is under a uh, hurricane watch. It said Miami Dade County is under a tornado watch until 2 p.m. on my phone. Um, that was the same one. Here's this one. Okay, I was trying to look pleasant Sunday, but I got these two hurricane watches. Oh, here it is. Oh, I'm sorry. It's starting at 11:30. So they're having uh, they're start going to start their pleasant Sunday soon. So uh, and it's going to actually be at they they have been having their services online, but this is actually going to be, if I'm correct, at the temple. He says, uh, and they're going to do a review of their lessons. So, uh, oh, and for the other announcement, uh, May 4th is um, Mother Pat's birthday. Uh, May 5th is called Cinco de Mayo, is a, 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 a Latin celebration, which is May 5th. Mother's Day is May 14th, the Day of Ascension, which is a day that is cel was celebrated where Christ ascended up into heaven in the cloud, is May 18th. We're going to have a consecration on May 21st, Pentecost is the day that the um, disciples had the flame, tongue, flame, uh, flaming tongues of come on their head um, with the Holy Spirit coming on them. That would be on May 28th and Memorial Day is May 29th. So I think, so to get Mimi birthday is May 10th. Uh, no, I don't need to add that. So we have Mimi on May the 10th. So are there any other announcements? Or any other comments? It's Melanie, right? I don't want to forget it. <laughs> Y'all spell it M I M I. Come on. That's what I have, isn't it? That's not what's on my computer. Mine just says Emma. So those are our announcements. We're taking back collections. So I'd like to thank those who've made donations to us. And uh, thank you, because a lot of people are sending in through, through Cash App, through Zell, so we appreciate your contributions and thank you so much for helping support us. We'll have uh, go through our dismissal in a minute here.
keep on. Trying to say, so let me just say for our dismissal, um, may the love of God illuminate your way, may the truth of God, may the will of God direct you to stay, may the truth of God all errors depart, and may the peace of God forever dwell in your heart. Amen, amen, amen. So we're going to, oh, I don't think I started the recording, did I? Did I? Oh, I did. Okay. I'll, um, I'll stop recording.